Hello and welcome to the Kui Mungay Institute, our Q&A conversation for exploration series. I'm Paul Robert, the executive director and president of the Institute, and along with my wife, Laura Lee, the director of research, education, and outreach. And on behalf of our board of directors, our advisors, our volunteers, and supporting members, we do want to thank you for joining us today. The Kui Mungay Institute is an independent nonprofit research organization committed to researching consciousness and the human experience following the footsteps of our founder, anthropologist Dr. Felicitas Goodman. And our focus is in three main areas, experience, education, and exploration. We respect the path of academic balance, the creative pursuit of science, while advancing, conserving, and restoring a direct experience of that deeper human connection to all of life. It's part of our mission to expand our own experiential research with the multidisciplinary understanding that's available to us today. So as an educational institution, we take an open approach and we invite scholars and in related fields to help broaden the scope of our own work and exploration. And that's why we call this conversation for exploration. On these Sunday discussions, we've had a full spectrum of topics from neuroscience and anthropology and archaeology, astronomy, eco-spirituality, uh, ecology, philosophy, mythology, shamanism, ritual, hero's journey, it goes on and on and on, from the arts to the sciences and so much more. We have a couple hundred presentations between webcasts and YouTubes that are available on our website, all for free. We do invite you uh, also to join us as a nonprofit to become a supporting member. And we want to thank you, the community members who continue to support the mission of the Cuyamangay Institute. Today, we want to take a look at the role of music, not only in today's world, but in the world also from the perspective of traditional people. The profound and sophisticated relationship between music and indigenous people is a testament to the enduring power of culture and tradition. And across the globe, indigenous communities have created and cherished music as a central facet of their identity and heritage. The connection between music and indigenous people transcends mere entertainment. It's a profound expression of their history, their spirituality, and their ongoing struggles for cultural expression and preservation. And today our guest will guide us into the rich tapestry of one tribe, Amazonian tribe, uh, examining its significance, diversity, in a way which it both reflects and shapes the experiences of their community. This will also offer us an opportunity to reflect on how music is, is a companion in our own lives, serving many roles to express the emotions from the melancholy to the joy, to bond us, to inspire us entice us and to gauge us in a deeper connection to all of the human experience. And so questions arise, you know, why does music so move us and why can music impact us in such a powerful way? And how does it mobilize us, trigger us and connect us heart, mind, and soul? Well, I think music is our best export to the world here uh, in this country. But it was these very questions that led our guest, Anthony Seeger, he says to call him Tony, to his deep study of music and its impact on culture. Coming from a musical family with an uncle, folk singer and songwriter, Pete Seeger, seeing the power of words set to music to move us, Tony's key quest and questions in life were set, study the power of music. So with degrees in social relations at Harvard and in anthropology at the University of Chicago, and to live with an Amazonian tribe in Mato Grosso, Brazil, to learn how one traditional society integrates the power of music into their culture for rhythms, for everyday speech, for oratory, for recitation of myth and stories, for the rituals, dance and songs. Our guest says this friendship extending over 50 years has become an extended family. His book, Why Suya Sing, a musical anthropology of an Amazonian people and his recording and publishing of their story helped the Suya successfully and legally claim their ancestral lands. Now, wow. this is anthropology at its best. Mm -hmm. In Tony Seeger's long and far-reaching career, he's worn many hats, anthropologist, ethnomusicologist, audiovisual archivist, record producer, musician. 
He helped establish the musicology, ethnomusicology, and music education MA program at the Brazilian Conservatory of Music. He's given back to that country. He's curator and director emeritus of Smithsonian Folkways Recordings, where he produced more than 250 CDs, as well as collaborated on DVDs and a radio series. And he serves as Distinguished Professor of Ethnomusicology Emeritus at the University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA. And in addition to his popular book, Why Suya Sing, he's published two other books on the Suya and uh, over 120 articles and book chapters on the music and culture of indigenous Brazilians, on indigenous rights issues, on ethnomusicology, on audiovisual archiving, on American music, on intellectual property, wide, wide ranging. And he joins us from a small town in the countryside of Vermont. And uh, welcome, Tony. <laughs> Good to have you here. My, what a career. What an oh, impact thank- you've had. And um, yeah. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here and um on this this morning and uh, th- i'm so glad i heard how to pronounce the kuyamonge institute's name uh, <laughs> i i did know felicitas goodman slightly and and attended some of her presentations at conferences oh. and um so yeah. it's, it's a particular pleasure to to be here at, at an organization that founded sort of as part of her memory and and con- enduring contribution so uh, yes it's nice to be here and i'm i'm at your disposition well, um, I also want to acknowledge Lawson Malnuri, a member of our community, who also got his uh, recently MA in ethnomusicology. He says that your book, Why This Why Suya Singh, was part of his curriculum. So your um, your book is having impact on today's crop of budding ethnomusicologists. So yeah. that's good to know. So you said you coming from a musical family, you had really to study music and its power. You saw it firsthand with your with your uncle, Pete Seeger, and his impact. Can you tell us how this quest began for you? Sure. I was born into a musical family that of which Pete was just one member. Uh, my parents sang, and uh, I was raised to sing. Uh, my uncle, Mike Seeger, uh, was also a professional musician, as was my aunt Peggy Seeger, who is now living in England. Um, there were others. I have cousins who were performing. And so we, we, the whole family. If you're, if you're, if you're a singer, you sort of have to explain why you're not musical, or you want to, <laughs> you want to flee it all together because there are quite enough musicians, and there's you want to do something else and and, and be different. Which a is a new tag weird. within music, yeah. Right. My our our daughters have gone more into dance than 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 musical performance. The in the 1950s, which is when I was in grade school. Uh, my uncle Pete uh, was investigated by the House on American Activities Committee and held in contempt of Congress. Uh, it was a period of the McCarthy hearings, and and there was a tremendous amount of fear on on the left and and anger. Uh, the, the the musical community in the in New York City, which is where I was born and grew, grew up until I was a teenager. Uh, was 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 broken in, in pieces by people who took one side or another, named other people's names or not, and I grew up um, a, a rather angry young boy. Um, I, uh, I I I thought. I thought that it was quite unjust to to sing the national anthem in my private school, so I wouldn't sing it. Um, because how can you say that it's the home of the brave and the land of the free if you're putting people in jail uh, for the songs they sing and the people they've sung to? So uh, that that early sort of youth experience of growing up in a particularly tense time in American history and politics, uh, in which the arts specifically, uh, movies and, and in some cases, some musicians were, were targeted by, by right-wing organizations uh, for activities that would normally be considered entertainment. Um, so I, uh, I, uh, that, that led me to, to know that when I was in college and, and thinking about studying music, well, first of all, I started to play the banjo when I was 10. Uh, and, and in eighth grade, I had a fan club of, um, uh, of, of screaming sixth graders that would scream when I came by. And, and, uh, and that's when I decided that my name, Tony Seeger, powerful. Yeah. Tony Seeger was what I signed on autographs and Anthony Seeger was what I got, but, but this is more of a Tony Seeger event. So call me Tony in college. 
I, I, I thought, well, I didn't want to perform music for a living. There were too many of my relatives doing that already. And it wasn't a really very easy life at all. So I decided I would study it. And I, I, what I was really interested in was why is music, what's the power of music? Why, if, 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 why do so many musicians get put in jail or in some cases killed? Why, what, for singing a song? How, how, how does that, how, what is it about music that makes it so powerful? Uh, I knew it was powerful. And I knew it was more than just an aesthetic event. And so I decided to study anthropology because it seemed to me anthropology was asking broad questions about the nature of humankind. And um, I minored in folklore and, and stories and myths and, and, and things like that. But I, my particular interest was in how, uh, how music was part of social life and what its role was within uh, societies. That's how I got started, and that's that's how I that's why I ended up in anthropology. It was because I wanted to study music, not because I wanted to study only kinship or something like that. And that's that directed my career until now. While I'm still, no matter what kind of music I'm I'm watching people listen to, I'm still wondering where is the power for them of that music, and, and what's happening to them as they listen. Mm -hmm. mm, it's exciting. How did you end up at a, a small tribe in Brazil? What was that invitation? I mean, do they go, hey, bring on the anthropologist or was it a happenstance or was it, do you just wander around and meet that? How does that, how do the connections made? How do you feel yeah. about that's, that's a really good question. And and it, it it's much more complicated than just sort of walking up and, and knocking on a door and saying, hi, I'm an anthropologist. Can I live with you for two years? And yeah, I I mean, would you yeah. open your door if someone knocked on the door and said, hi, I'm here for two years to live Let with you? Study uh, you. And, yeah. and why would I be there? So the, 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 the reason I wanted to study the, the Kinseji in the end was that I had a question. Now, some ethnomusicologists decide here a kind of music they just love and fall in love with it and decide I've got to know more about that and, and study it. Others uh, like myself have a question and then they look for where is the best place to get the answers to this question. Mm. And my question uh, as I was coming up in graduate school was um, what, how, what is the role of music in society? How is it related? How are the sounds and the way people perform related to the cosmology they have and the beliefs they have about the world and the, the universe? And also how is it related to the way they live their lives and to the groups they're part of? And I decided I wanted to study this. So that, that's sort of the big question. Like, big question, you can study that almost anywhere. You can study it in your backyard. Um, but uh, I decided, uh, there were personal reasons I didn't want to study it in the United States popular music. One is that I, since I was a child, I've woken up early and gone to bed early and haven't been able to stay up late at all. I have very sensitive hearing, so that it's excruciating for me to go to a to a to a concert where the where the where the the music is ramped up in it. I knew that was part of the experience. And finally, I don't like large crowds. I feel much more comfortable in a big empty space, which is why I'm up here in Vermont these days, um, uh, to, to being in a, in, a, in a city. So I couldn't imagine studying popular music. So mm -hmm. I thought, well, if I'm not gonna study popular music, because I can't. Uh, research has its personal aspects and its theoretical aspects. I'll go back to that theoretical questions and ask it somewhere else. So I said, I wanna study the relationship between what people think and their cosmology, what people perform their music and how people live their, their lives, how they're organized. And I want to do it in a non-capitalist society. I want to do it in a place without money. And, and so that was, that left me the world of a rather restricted part of the world. Only parts of the world live like that without, without mm -hmm. markets and, and, and capitalism. And the second thing was, if you're going to look for a place where those things are interrelated somehow, you need to find a place where missionaries haven't changed the cosmology, they haven't changed the, and yeah. where, where they aren't selling their labor and capitalism hasn't changed their relationships among themselves and with yeah. respect to things. And so it has to be a place with no money. And, and then it also has to be a place where there's music. <clears throat> there were a few places in the world, but this is where a sort of real life comes in. My wife was, is a specialist in Romance languages in Spanish and Portuguese. So we decided, well, it, wherever it is, it probably better be in Brazil or, or, or a Spanish speaking country. And we went to Brazil. The Quinceji fit that because they had, never, they had made peace with Brazilians 
about 12 years before I got there. They had stopped fighting and made a peaceful relationship with them. And they um, had never had any missionaries. Missionaries were not allowed in the region that they were in. And they also mm -hmm. uh, had, there was no money. There were no stores. You couldn't get anything there. Um, the only way things could come in would be on a, on, a, on a weekly Air Force plane that would drop supplies about 100 miles away uh, from where I was. And then you would have to hope that somebody would bring them down in a canoe or a, or a boat down to nearer where you could get them in a canoe. So it was, it was a very distant place and, and there was simply no, so it was beyond, it was sort of beyond the frontier in, in some senses. It wasn't really, but it was because there were no stores and there was no money. So they were, they were living as they had been living in many ways uh, for a very long time. A good choice. How do you make contact? How do you? Well, again, you, that's, that's also a good question. Most anthropologists, though they may not say so, don't make contact themselves first. They make contact through an intermediary. Mm -hmm. And that's particularly true uh, these days. Um, the, the person who made peace with the Kinseji uh, in Also known years, as the Suya. Also yeah. the Suya. Yes, I'll, I'll get to that later. But who, the Suya. Uh, the person who made peace with them was very trusted by them. And he'd stayed there in the region with his brother, to, to take care of the groups that they were uh, uh, sort of bringing together into the region. And uh, they were nominated for Nobel Peace Prizes. Because of this, they never received one, but it, they were very well known, uh, uh, what they call sertanistas in Brazil. And my request to study the music and language and life of the, of the Suya went through the National Research Council of Brazil and was sent to him. And so he went and he said to the, to the Suya, I only found this later, uh, this later, he said, well, do, do you want to have two Americans come and, and live with you? Um, <laughs> they will sing for you. They're, they're musicians. They'll sing for you whenever you want. And they're going to write a book and I'm going to read that book. Uh, so be sure to tell them the truth. And also, and if yeah. you don't like them, don't kill them. Tell me you don't like them and I will send them away and they will never come back. So that was, that was how they were, how they were told. Yeah. about me and they decided yes they would it was all right uh, because they had reasons of their own they wanted me there mm -hmm. oh which you only discovered later reasons of, of course their own. Back, yeah. yeah 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 so so off you went and this yep. became a 50-year relationship so far probably yeah, it did. I've done many. I've done many other things over the years, and and I, I swore I'd finish all my writing on them in ten years after I got my dissertation done because I thought I would do other things. So I have done other things, but but they've always sort of been one of the balls I'm trying to keep in the air because mm -hmm. we like each other, we know each other, we've cared about each other, we've nursed each other when we were ill, and um, and it's an experience my wife and I also share because we did all of our all of all of my research was done with her as well so that um so it's part of it's part of our lives and our children's lives as they went to the field with you us watched each other's children grow up we you? did and and yeah. um ask about them when we talk to each other now on whatsapp yeah. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Uh, you have do you want to put it into context what you're going to show us because you have some wonderful film clips audio clips photos Slides. really going to tell us about this journey so yes i am and i'm going to be talking I'm going to start my timer here so that I don't talk forever. I, I really like questions. I, I, I'm going to try to keep my part short so that you can ask questions because then I can really address the things that you care about. Um, my, I'm going to be talking about a ceremony that the Kinseji, that the Suya do. Uh, the Suya used to be called the Suya. For 150 years, they were known in the literature as the Suya. But their name for themselves wasn't Suya, it was Kinseji. And like many groups in North America who were called by names that were invented by other people and, and told to the, to the conquering uh, Europeans who arrived, they, they have wanted to change their name for some time. And so in 19, oh, 2001 or so, I think they just decided, no, we're gonna change our name. So please call us by Kinseji. And so I do. Um, but it's confusing since they were known for so long by Suya, and my book is called Why Suya Sing. Uh, so the, I'll call them Kinseji. It means people of the large open village places. Mm. And I'm going to focus on a single ceremony because the book Why Suya Sing focuses on that ceremony. Uh, it, um, it begins uh, with sort of a 
a formal opening and then runs for weeks as people are getting ready for it. And then the last night is is um, is that it's when all the big things happen and people do their major performance and sing all night long. And then in the day and, and transform into animals and, and, and in the day transform back. Right. Pardon me. <clears throat> I have a, a bit of a cold. So and so it's, it's a very powerful ending. And uh, it's that's typical of many uh, American South American Indian ceremonies. Uh, so I, I want I'm going to be and I started chapter one with beginning chapter six was the end and the seventh chapter was well why do you see I sing what what's going on in all this, and through it I run through a number of different genres of sound and vocal art, um, and uh, I, I wanted to bring people the ability to hear the music that I was talking about, because it's one thing to see somebody's transcription and musical notation, but it doesn't look at all like what it really sounds. And so I've insisted on having a cassette with a book back in 1987, yeah. and then a, a CD with a book with a second edition in, in 2004. Yeah. And then uh, in 2015, when it was translated and published in Brazil, uh, a, a DVD instead of a CD because actually you really can't tell what music is until you've seen it performed with people mm. moving as they dance because in fact they'd never sing without moving and furthermore they prepare their bodies in very elaborate increasingly elaborate ways over over the during mm -hmm. the, the ceremony so so it's all part so I'm going to be showing you some videos of the ceremony um, and uh, just as I was finishing the Portuguese translation of the book I discovered that, that some young Kinseji had decided to make their own video of the same ceremony mm -hmm. uh, called the mouse ceremony. And I said, oh, I didn't know you were doing that. Could you send it to me? And I got it. And I was terrified. I thought, oh, my God, what if, what if I, everything I wrote was wrong? Mm. What, if, what, if, what if what they show and say in this film has nothing to do with what, with what I said? I said, do I have to give back the awards? The book is one if, if it's wrong. So there was, was some trepidation that I actually watched it. And it actually, it pretty much confirmed. It's very similar to my description. In mm -hmm. fact, they even refer to my book in it um, because they, they were, the, it was being translated into Portuguese and, and the translation checked by them for content as well as for, as well as for sound. So anyway, so what you're gonna see some of their video and then I'm gonna show you some things that are more analytic that, that are mine. And I'm gonna talk about how music, the cosmos and social life are in fact interrelated, not only interrelated, but to a certain extent enacted through performances of music and dance. I'm so glad to really look at the underlayment of what a story or a song or lyrics or a dance says, because we can't help but wrap up our cosmology in everything we do, right? Our, our perspective, our understanding, our sense of our world and our place in it is just wrapped up in everything that we express. So I think that's, that's an intriguing aspect to all this. So... Yeah, and looking, at, looking at looking at music from the perspective of ritual, that it has that power, that 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 ability to engage us in a, in a, in a way that in this particular in this particular instance yeah. maintains cultural tradition and understanding, but also is alive. It, that it's something that's still bringing forth activated today an activation. Yeah, yeah, we we're of the of the ilk that ritual has power. All of this has power. You're, you're stirring an energetic sure. uh, cauldron yeah. here. So, well, yeah. it does. And and for the Kinseji, music is only used for things that are powerful and for ritual. There uh -huh. are no lullabies. There yeah. are no work songs. And for a seeger, there were even no protest songs. So, yeah. so this was a community where music, when it was used, was used for powerful things. The and, sacred things. Well, not yeah. sacred or powerful. Sacred is a word I don't always use, but it, it can mm -hmm. can work. But so the powerful, it can be powerful. You can things. you might you might sing a song to make someone healthy or something like that. So the power is there to transform the inside of the body to make things happen. But it's not necessarily spiritual in that case. It, it's more interesting. It's more yeah. it's it's a metaphor sort of cre that has a physical representation. But anyway, so I'd be happy to talk about that. Shall I? Would you like me to start, or would you have another yes. question before we go? Yes, yes. Well, let's let's launch the uh, program. Well, we'll have plenty of questions. Changed your this... understanding, how it grew your understanding of music. So we'll yeah. get that at the end. Uh, yeah. Write down your questions because yes, I'm, I'm not going to. I'm, I've set my timer here. I don't plan to talk for too long. 
uh, you're mostly going to be seeing things. Let's see. All right, I'm going to start that. Let me introduce you to the Keen Set Gene, to, to, to our relationship to a certain extent through sound. Um, so in the world, there were a number of places I might have gone. In the end, we went to Brazil. In the end, we went to the central part of Brazil. I don't know if my thing is showing up just mm -hmm. north of Cuiabá. Right about there mm -hmm. is, a, is a large indigenous area called the Xingu, uh, the, parque, the indigenous territory of the Xingu. And the Kinseji live have lived for a hundred and some odd years in in on the, on a river of their own called the the Little Suya River, and um, because there was very little gold, there was no gold found in this region, and there wasn't a there were a bunch of really uh, uh, really aggressive indigenous peoples to the east. Most of the most of the terror, most of the settlement of Brazil passed around this part of Mato Grosso. It was basically it was a large swamp and um, small forests of not very valuable trees. So they were isolated for a pretty long time, um, encountering Brazilians from time to time, sometimes massacred by them, uh, sometimes poisoned by them, but, but, um, but they, were, they, they survived. Not all groups survived in Brazil. And this is a simplified map of the region they lived in. The Xingu has, has a number of, this is the Xingu, and it goes right on up in, in, into the Amazon, coming in from the south. And the there are a number of indigenous groups that live in what's called the Upper Shingu, this part up here, which is the upriver part. And then this, the, so the Suya King said you live here. They were living right here uh, in 1884 or something, when a, a German explorer went through. And then they moved up into this area and um, when the lands were were allocated to indigenous peoples, their lands were left out. They were they were given away to to ranches, and so this Terrawawi is is that is the territory that <clears throat> that they, along with others, were able to get back uh, from from the uh, uh, back from the ranches, and is now theirs as well. Now, before I say much more, anthropology has a bad reputation. Um, in many indigenous peoples in the in in North America, especially, because um, anthropology developed during the colonial period and has been associated with power and exploitation since its start. And some anthropologists have a very bad reputation for for um, for uh, studying people and then doing nothing to to help them at all if, when they might have helped, and also not have, not having returned copies of their recordings or, or photos or anything, and just sort of abandoned them back the way they had been. Mm -hmm. And I, it's important to note that the nature of research and the kind of collaboration required of any anthropologist since the 1980s has really transformed that relationship and, and, and is, is doing a lot to change uh, the reputation of anthropology. Uh, we're, we're very much more involved in community action and community activities. And um, I've always thought that knowledge was not something that should be got obtained just for knowledge itself, but actually to change things. And um, I've thought that ever since I was in, in grade school, and I certainly think it now. So my research on the Kiseji was accompanied by a lot of political activity and other kinds of, of things, and as well as helping them with their land claims case. The Kiseji, as, as I described, authorized my research and at, at, in 1971, but also ever since, because I have to get their permission to come back each time. And they had their own reasons. One of the reasons was that if you have a powerful foreigner uh, uh, on your side, it, they can sometimes be very helpful. And <coughs> the, the Kiseji chief said that he, he wasn't sure he really wanted another uh, an anthropologist to come, but, but he was encouraged to do so by a chief of another tribe who said that sometimes whites were having a white was really useful. And so they called me their white, they called us their white people. Um, we, we were their, their anthropologists. And uh, so they, they, they had a reason for having, wanting us and we had a reason for being there. And so we got along quite well. Um, this is us, we, the person who's, who did the research is not the one you're looking at on the screen. Uh, before it's this person here who was a young graduate student who went with his wife uh, down to the Amazon and uh, settled in to learn the language, uh, plant a garden, 
and live for years. We lived for 15 months there during the first part of our, during, the, during our doctoral research, and then have spent probably another 12 over the ensuing years of, on shorter yeah. visits. What an adventure, yeah. Well, it's an adventure and an enjoyable thing. We felt privileged to be able to live in as clean and clear a place with such nice people as the Kinseji were. Um, it was a far healthier place, even though people say, oh my God, you're going to the Amazon, you're going to die. Uh, it was a much healthier place than, than the slums around Rio because um, the only thing there was was pneumonia and, and malaria. And um, we didn't get it all the time. Um, and then here in 2015, which is what a whole lot of time later, um, on our most recent trip back, because my 2000 trip was canceled because of COVID, um, here we are. We, they asked us to come back this time because the women had decided to perform a ceremony they hadn't done in 50 or 60 years. Oh. I'd never seen it before. And they wanted my wife back to come back and participate in it with them because, um, well, because she adds to the, to the fun of doing a ceremony and what uh, is having what people that you care about together. Yeah. So it's a wonderful education for her. And um, so that's why she's all painted up and, and dressed, and I'm not. Um, it was a women's ceremony only. Uh, so, so we have we have changed. The Kiseji have changed, but the music goes on. Now, one of the ways ethnomusicologists learn about music is participating if they're invited, because when you actually perform music, you learn things about it that you don't get when you're just listening to it. There, there. Are, there are physical aspects of vocal presentation, of a sort of positioning of the vocal cords that are that are that when you're actually having to do it, you discover how difficult they are. And um, there is this dance, and sometimes you can you don't necessarily experience the same thing that other people experience, but you are experiencing singing together and dancing together as a group. And this is this was one of the one of the ceremonies I participated in when we were there, um, but. They also liked our music. We took a banjo and guitar into the field because we've been playing our whole lives. And um, they liked it. Some, some ethnomusicologists and anthropologists have gone to the field with an instrument and people hate it. And they say, oh, leave, leave it in its case. We don't want to hear that stuff. We want to hear something else or make our own music. But, but our music was one of the ways that, can, one of the things that contributed to their happiness. Performances and ceremonies are all about euphoria and happiness, and the more kinds of things going on every night, the better. And so we were, we were often part of a of a ceremony, uh, brought out when the moon was full uh, or bright enough so that they could see us perform and also see me tell the story of the giant Abi Yo Yo, um, which they greatly appreciated and terrified children. Um, so, so this is this is a photo taken in 1995. My wife wasn't with me on this trip, but but. Um, uh, of they they sang along they learned our songs um, sometimes they would apply their own words to them and sometimes they would learn word for word in English uh, the women particularly liked a ballad called Pretty Polly where uh, which is a describes how a woman is taken by her boyfriend into the woods and killed and buried uh, and they, they thought that was a, that's a that was a great story and so they they learned it and they could sing pretty polly pretty polly come take a walk with me pretty polly pretty polly come take a walk with me. just like that in, in perfect english they also knew the songs of about seven other uh, communities, indigenous communities, and they also knew a song in French that they had learned. So they were multi-musical, far more multi-musical than most Americans are. Yeah. And um, they really liked other people's music. When I first went, there were very few of them. And they lived in a very isolated village on a, on a river, there, this little Suya River, but it only had six houses. Um, and one under construction. There were about a hundred people in there, and um, and and because they were the survivors of, of a terrible period of, of population loss due to measles and 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 massacres and and uh, poisonings, and so th they were gathered there in a in a very isolated place. And this was where we spent most of our my pre my dissertation research was in a very small village. I lived in this house. We sang in the center. There was a small men's house over there. And um, they all said, well, this is really, well, this is a very small village. In the old days, we used to have great big villages and, and people were powerful and strong. Well, in 2006, 
uh, there they are. They have a large village. There were 28 houses instead of six going on seven. And But in addition to the houses, uh, there's also an airstrip, mm. which you can see. And there's also a road. And that road ends in the village, but it goes all the way to Sao Paulo and through a whole bunch of small cities and in, in, in Mato Grosso, and then on to the biggest cities in the country. So today, they're very much connected in 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 a number of ways with the rest of the world. And yet they're trying very hard to protect the things that they think are important about their lives and their way of living and being. And I, I'm gonna just wanna look at this photograph up a little closer, different photograph. Um, there's a large clear place in the center of all these houses. And that's that's the plaza. And that's where most of the music happens. Some happens in, the, in a house, but then you move back out. So you go in and out and then in and out of another house and then you sing around the village. Yeah. And, and, so, and this here is the, is the men's house. Or, and so this is a place of, sort of, of ritual power um, and also where the men gather to, to talk and to cook food and, and, um, and prepare for ceremonies, um, to paint sometimes. Uh, and this center, right exactly between, sort of in the middle between these houses and this house, so there's a, a sort of a central spot where um, there might be some logs. I can't see the logs here. And then people gather at night. Uh, men gather at night in, in the center and women gather in front of all the houses because the houses belong to women. And if the central space belongs, sort of is, is, is often occupied by men and ceremony, the women sort of control the, the houses around the edge and there are ceremonies in which women occupy the center and, the, and disperse the men uh, uh, to, to sort of to invert the normal order of things. Um, so and, and to take power. So, so and the, as you're looking around this village, you also see a lot of these little white spots. If, if you have a mm -hmm. large screen, do you know what those are? They're parabolic antennas. Oh, and so, so the, I would the, not have guessed that. Uh, yeah. The king said you are not are not totally isolated out there. They they have, uh, you know, they are connected. So while this is a very distant place, it's very connected, and I think that is the water tower they've had to build because the the ranches have so polluted the the rivers with um, agrotoxins that they've found they have to now uh, have uh, have solar panel driven wells that. Um, that keep the, the, the from which they they get water because the the, the river is too polluted to, to want to drink. Yeah. The book is an artifact. I rubbed it, I published it. And I wrote it in nineteen eighty five and six. It was published in nineteen eighty seven, and and it doesn't change much, though each edition changes in its uh, in a postscript, because the publishers don't want me to change the inside. That's too expensive to retype set. So. Yeah. Um, so it has. So the book book is an artifact, and it doesn't change. But the king said you change a lot, and um, and yet they're still doing the ceremony. And this is um, the, I've sent them by recordings and myths of, uh, of songs as well. And, and so this is just I put this picture in to show that they too are using computers, and they too are are analyzing stories, and they too are looking both at the past and at the present and imagining the future. Mm. Now I'm going to show you some videos. And they were made with the knowledge and approval of the King Seji. And they were published in CD and DVD with their permission. And all the rights in composition and performance are reserved by the Association Indigenous de King Seji, their foundation. And in 2001, they specifically requested recordings of them not be posted on the internet except as authorized or posted by them. Mm -hmm. So you're seeing these, but please don't take them out of context and post them elsewhere. This, it's perfectly all right for me to talk about the book and, and these because they're part of the book. Um, uh, you can also buy a video of theirs for $3 or $2, you can rent it, um, that, act, that is wonderful and you'll enjoy and is perfectly free for your use. So uh, un unauthorized use of these recordings is prohibited not only by law, but also by the moral obligation to prevent the exploitation of these artists and the exploitation of their knowledge. So I, I wanted to put that first because anthropologists do have such a bad reputation. And many people do go with cameras into places and, and just record anything they want without asking permission. And, and I have always paid royalty to the Kinseji and I always respected their um, request for change for, for what I include and what I don't. So here's the Kinseji film. 
it's a wonderful filmmaker uh, who uh, decided with his friends and uh, to to make a film on the Kinseji, and he called it the mouse ceremony or the uh, a festa the the, 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 the the because of, it's in the um, it's in five uh, the publication is in five languages, but they were they were filming it in Portuguese and speaking in Kinseji in it. Um, here's the Vimeo site. And I'm just going to, before a ceremony starts, you have to end something. Mm. And so before every ceremony, there's a, there's a morning in which uh, people are, are called to the center to take a ceremonial public bath. Um, because what you're doing, what people have, you have to end mourning before you can begin euphoria. And so there's a formal ending of all this mourning and all the sadness from all the people who have died in the, since the last ceremony. And um, some people don't want to participate, and so they won't take a bath, and they also won't be singing and performing in the ceremony. But most people do. And so before you, it's, it's, I wouldn't call it purification, but it is a public sort of announcement of mourning is over, now we're starting on something else. Mm. Perfect. Uh, the Q said you do not include that in their video, but here goes, here's their video. Um, the, I'm going to show you several minutes of it. And as you're watching it, you're going to be distracted by the, by what you see, but try to follow what the story is and try to listen to how the songs are performed. Atara turn, a contrajikin kidanjipa. And while just Jesus come, a decoy pata tumro kayong. Nay, a term, a little better onzi. Nay, a man and you must soon buy me, a kumto kindo palm. I do a man green candy, pa, pinto tea, Kokoyamano tea, Kangrin tea, Queen tea. Jaikun, <laughs> Metal <laughs> <laughs> Get to Mena and Menanironi, Kin, who am Tomacaron talking Lopa. I don't know you, my kid, you will go to you, my kid, in Venezuela. It's all right. So I wanted to interrupt this just to show that when people study their own society, they also have to study it and, and interview people. And so these young, young filmmakers. Are having to are trying to do the same thing I did, which is find out how did this ceremony start, and um, where did it come from, and I went to the same person in the end they were sent to, and got their the same answer they did. When you get it, Yon, 
Well, there's a lot to talk about there, but there are just a couple of things I, I want to mention. Um, first, the song you just heard, those shouted songs are, are, have a name and they're contrasted with, with the unison songs. Uh, the shouted songs, you don't sing what you want. In a sense, in, in the Kinseji, you sing who you are when you're singing individual songs. So if you're a, a child, you sing a silly one that's very short. And then when you're a teenager, you're allowed to sing longer ones and you sing longer ones that are more that are serious, that aren't jokes. And then um, when you get to be a grandparent, uh, you don't sing that. Well, when you get to be a parent and have several children, you start singing them, but you don't stress as high. You sing them at a lower pitch. And then when you're a grandparent, like I am father of three children, a grandfather of three children, grandchildren, then um, you don't sing them at all. Instead, you go, whoo, 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 which you might hear in the background sometimes. Uh, but it means I'm hungry, feed me, feed me, feed me. And, and that's the characteristic shout of older people who are also clowns. Mm. Now, the other thing that, that you saw there um, was the story of, of a man meeting a mouse in the, in the woods and the mouse looked like a person. And, and the two of them went off to the village of the mice, which is underground. And underground, the mice sort of zip off their, their outer their outer coat, and they look like humans too. And so uh, what the man was doing was being shown the ceremony of the mice, and he watched it very carefully, and he learned it, and he brought it back and taught it to people in the village. And that's the origin of, of many of the, of the ceremonies in a, a Kinseji perform or know about. It's things are taken from enemy people or from enemy uh, or from animals, because when music isn't composed by humans. They say that they don't make up their music, they don't compose it, but rather they learn it by walking through the forest and listening to what the trees are singing or by going down underground and finding out what the mice are singing, or in some cases, even by hearing an ethnomusicologist singing to them, but they all their music comes from outside. Uh, and that's part of where its power comes from. So, so where music comes from, uh, so how, where it comes from is an important question to ask. And for them, it comes from outside and powerful and, and sort of strange uh, metamorphosed, metamorphosed beings. Now here's a, I think it's a later clip. Um, so um, the other thing that he mentions, he said, well, 
he mentions two groups. He said there are two groups of, of, of people. We, we divide ourselves into, into uh, par parakeets and and um, oh. which are Kran and, and Piranha. And we call it, anthropologists call those moieties. It's divided in half. And you're divided into those groups according to your name. And so twos happen a lot everywhere in, in Suya cosmology. There are two directions, east and west. The others, the, the others don't have names. They're just the edges of the sky. Uh, there's a village. You saw that village as a center and a periphery. The center is cleared of all kinds of grass and everything. And then the periphery is the houses and beyond there's another periphery of sort of um, uh, scrappy, shrubby stuff. And then beyond that, there's the forest. And so you have this contrast between clear and green and you also have sort of human and center of, act of, of social activity and, and the forest where the animals are. And that's why the, the man encounters the mouse out there when he's sleeping out in the forest overnight. That's when that's mm -hmm. when you actually encounter the spiritual beings of nature. And time also is to, has two aspects. There's, there's the rainy season and the dry season. And uh, you refer to a year as, as sort of, um, but it, it's another, uh, it's another dry season after dry season, but every season has two dry, that's two, every year has two seasons and it pretty much does. It rains during about <clears throat> half the year and it's, it's, doesn't rain during about half the year, though there are times when it does. That's important um, because people have two identities and th they have their families and they have these name relationships they have. And music is, has all kinds of things that divide into two. Um, if most songs have two halves. There's a first half and a second half. Um, they have the same melody, but the, the words change a bit and the way they're sung will change as, as you'll hear and there are two major genres one is the unison shout songs that we that you saw where you sing how old you are and you also sing because you're a man and not a woman and and they're individual shouted songs and then there are unison songs where everybody tries to make their voices sound the same and so young children are not supposed to sing those because their voices aren't low enough. Mm. And you'll hear some of that coming up. And the two seasons of year have different songs. Uh, the year actually is it's the songs that divide the year because the rains are sort of intermittent. You never when the when the rain season has really begun. But when the song for the rainy season start being sung, that's the beginning of the rainy season. So it's a bit like without being uh, I hope without offending anybody, it's a bit like Christmas. You know, Christmas has a certain day when the when the big events happen, or uh, mm -hmm. but actually, when does it begin? It begins when you start hearing Christmas carols and the, the wherever oh, yeah. you go, and so it's a bit like that. The Suya announced the beginning of of rainy season formally by starting to sing that song, and then everybody knows it's the rainy season, and then they sing a certain type of song throughout that whole period, and then they'd start the dry season with another song. Um, and so to a certain extent, a year is a concert because the year begins with one song and it has a second part and then it comes back. And so, so the whole year is a concert. Mm, and, and so time, like time, is, time is really different. Their idea of, of what, it, what a musical piece is is different because it's related to other pieces and, and it's not a three minute song. Now the ceremonial groups, sit to sing on the east and west side of the men's house. So you get the, you get space, cosmological space, and also physical space, and also sound all interacting. Hmm. Now, now, this next section of the film, <clears throat> he's telling the other story about the mouse ceremony. And uh, here it goes. And you'll, you'll also see that their use of some of the footage that I've sent them and um, and uh, how uh, recordings from the past can be used to understand the present. Are you? Met on in theatre. 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 Met on in theatre.
ในวันที่ก็เป็นเราสุขกันดีถึงกับชีวิตเราสุขกันดีถึงกับชีวิตเราสุขกันดีถึงกับชีวิตเราสุขกันดีถึงกับชีวิตเราสุขกันดีถึ
the first part and then it names an animal. So every performance of it begins with no words and then goes to the name, to an action and then goes to an animal and an action. And listen to it. it it's not all here, but it will be about four minutes. And... <laughs> I tried to show you the, 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 that song and its two parts, partly because it, it is the central, the, 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 I organized the book so that it would start with the more contextual things and then go more and more specifically into music. And the central, this chapter is all about one song, basically. And so um, this is the song I chose because I wanted to demonstrate how dual the sounds are. And, and also I wanted to, <clears throat> I wanted to make a point it sounds like they're repeating the same thing over and over again, but yeah. they're not really. It's it's a bit like water going under the bridge. It is never the same water twice, um, yeah. and yeah. and so here's what's actually happening. There's some there's the pitch of the song is actually changing slowly as as it goes on. It's rising and then it goes back down a little bit and then it goes back up and then it goes down and and, and ends. So there's a, there's a change in in the sort of the relative, the, the, 
the the whole pitch, the whole song rises. And here's here's I took a little back in the old primitive days before um, digital sound. I did this on a on a tape recorder just to try to show. Listen to how, how the the pitch of the same phrase uh, goes as they repeats. <laughs> So I won't play the whole thing, but you get the idea. Yes. You get the idea, that... and I would suspect that that's in part how the music makes its magic happen, its power, is by leading you up to a crescendo, isn't it? It's kind of pacing you. Um Yes, leading you emotionally somewhere, uh, uh, and it's found in a lot of South American Indian um, perform musical performances. Mm -hmm. Though most people actually don't hear it, most most Europeans don't hear it, and so it sounds like it's the same thing over and over again. But as you say, there's a kind of intensification oh. in this, and um, and there there's a group, a tribe called the Waura, who who have shamans in the up on the, the northern part of Venezuela. And when the wild art shamans are actually curing people, they have rising pitch. But when they were singing just for the tape recorder of the anthropologist studying them, there was no rise. So, so clearly part of the efficacy and power is coming from something mm -hmm. um, that, that we often think of as, oh, they're going sharp. But in fact, it's, it's more than that. Hmm. Oops, stop, stop. Let's see if I can. Oh. Um, we, knowledgeable. I think it's probably time to ask questions because we don't have that much time left. Sure. So I'll skip and let's the stop rest. your share so we can see. And you. I'll stop the share. Let me just let's see if really I really what what stop. it is is theater. Hey. There's hey. costume. There's gesture. There's song. There's dance. There's it's very purposeful in in its design. So though they hadn't done that ceremony for decades they knew all of its subtleties. So even conveying from one generation to the next is uh, very important there. It is. Okay. And, and and they spend a lot of time. Of course, that's the advantage of having a, a long ceremony. You have days to think about, well, how do I paint this? And how do I learn a song? Um, everybody has a new song for every ceremony. So all those individual songs are brand new. They've just learned them. And yeah. you learn them by hearing someone, an older person, tell you the song once. Uh, and then you're supposed to get up and be able to sing it. So they they train memory that way. Um, and they also thought I was very stupid because I never remember anything. And I, so they I would say, write it, write, it, it, write <laughs> it down, Tony. Um, <laughs> you won't remember. What's interesting also to me is that songs come from somewhere outside of oneself. So we are touching a field that's larger than ourselves. We have this dialogue going on with the universe at large. And when they encounter their animal spirits, they're at night, so their eyes are closed. They're kind of in a dream state. And so that's where these encounters happen. That's where we're able to speak to the animal spirits. That's very intriguing. Mm. That's what, what, I, what I didn't get a chance to say was in, during the last final night of the ceremony, everybody puts on a mask that's been made for them and dances. And during the, during the evening, they actually they're metamorphosed into, into mice humans who are mice and so they, they and, yeah. and 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 during the night they're singing as mice and so when they're singing in the first person they're actually singing as mice in the first person mm -hmm. i cut my mask i dance my mask and and um every child changes but every adult changes too and so in the middle of the night oh, about two in the morning the women uh, the men are singing and the women come in with long arrows and they wound all the mice by shoving arrows up into their into their masks and the wounded mice eventually before about dawn they start to die they very formalized they go out in groups by their names and then they stoop over and they die and, and the women strip off their masks throw cold water on them and take the mask back to the house so so what you have happening is a, a, a powerful transformation into a into a metamorphosed being of human and animal at the same time and then mm -hmm. it's ending 
and and the danger is that you might not return. And and there are stories oh, of, so of ceremonies that ended with people who didn't who couldn't turn back for because of something they'd done during the night. Um, so so that's that's an important that's part of the ceremony. That I would say is probably the most um, extrasensory perception. It's when you've been singing and dancing for ten hours or so. There oh, really yeah. is a change of feeling and a change of experience, and that's all the more so if it happens during a night. Uh, a long night where where there's, they don't do it for the moon, they, they, so it could be dark, and and yet so you're just singing and singing and dancing and dancing and singing and singing dancing and dancing. Mm -hmm. and the the king said the king said you don't use any psychedelic drugs. That a lot of indigenous peoples in South America do, but they're they they're sort of Anglo-Saxon mm -hmm. Protestant type Indians. They they don't they don't drink. They, they don't they don't smoke. Well, they do smoke, but they but they they don't take uh, they don't know of any uh, psychological uh, things. So all that's happening mm -hmm. is happening through song and dance and in their minds. Right. Mm -hmm. and it sort of follows up, I mean, with the research of Dr. Goodman talking about these altered states, having these experiences, these without, without having to use plant medicine or, or mm -hmm. something yeah. else, outside agents and being able to, in this case, using rhythm and sound and, and ritual and, and ritual through a consistent and inviting series. Spirits in. Yeah. yeah. yeah and the shape-shifting kind of transformation where the boundaries dissolve and you become other and uh yeah so it's oh, almost so interesting not imposing western terminology on it but that idea of being able to have an experience of what we think of as an alternate reality even though for them it's it's one reality i think possibly but the fact is is that you know we we have to explore and understand how this extension of the human experience reaches across this boundary line that we've established as westerners mm -hmm. and that when we when we have that opportunity to to uh, connect and see the stories and, from the indigenous, truly commune with nature from indigenous peoples, yeah. then we we learn more about ourselves and that there's this full expansion that that's available and accessible that's been down through history. Yeah. Right. Yes. Uh, there's a whole uh, uh, one of my former Brazilian students, Eduardo Vivero Chicastro, has developed a whole concept of perspectivism, in yeah. in which in which animals actually are like humans. They have their own perspective on the world, and so it's uh, nature is nature is other people, other beings looking at us as as animals in a way, and and there are moments when they can we can see each other, and shamans can make the transfer, but also during the ceremonies is when. The, the pers you, you have a dual perspective and mm -hmm. so it's one of the, it's one of those moments of, of contact um there was a very good question though that i just saw on the chat can i answer that question that sure the question, yes. let's the, go to the, question the, the yeah. question um was about why there aren't any women singing well this is a a men's naming ceremony and the women are very active uh but they're very active cooking uh, food and and they're very active in act, supporting roles of, of of painting and things like that, but they're not singing. They have their own ceremonies in which only women sing, and there are some ceremonies that men and women sing together. But this particular one uh, is 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 not on the, on the DVD I put together that goes with the book. I put a couple of tracks of women singing because I thought it was important to at least note that they did. Um, but but that's not this ceremony. Um, you have to ask your wife about the women's ceremony that she attended. Oh, I know a lot about it, and and um, and and in that case, the men played small bit parts, but the but the women mm -hmm. were really were really the. It's the interesting center. that the women were cooking because this was really a celebration and, in fact, a kind of origin story for their really prized and foodstuffs, the maize and the yams and the other, you know, gifted from the gods are gifted from the spirits are gifted you know, this, from nature from the mouse yes. and and, and the, the, mouse. The, mouse, the mouse gave corn only and and this is that there's oh. a moment in the in the season in the rainy season when suddenly all the corn is ripe or is getting ripe and so you eat corn we would we sort of dream in green and yellow because it was everything was yellow and green it was just you would eat corn for breakfast lunch and dinner you would have it sweet corn you would have it pound dried and pounded and you would have there was there was just lots and lots of corn, and and that's part of the, the, the that provides the food and energy for the ceremony, of course. And mm -hmm. and the king said you say several things about about music about ceremonies. I think it's worth actually telling you, um, because uh, where is it? It's I wrote them down even. And put it's, your hands it's, it's, it's in my book. There. To, to um, ask your questions. We're going to start with Lawson. Go okay, ahead. I said in some senses, this book barely goes beyond what the King said she told me. They told me, when we sing, we are euphoric. Mm -hmm. 
when we sing, we eat a lot because in fact, you organize into different groups and you get a whole lot, there are a whole lot more hunting and fishing going on. And so there's a lot of food and there's a huge <laughs> feast in the, in the last night of the ceremony, as well as the transformation. Well, it spends and, a lot of energy too, to do all this yep. ceremony. And it says, it is beautiful when everyone sings. And they say a village that performs ceremony is a good village. Yes, the dancers are mice. Yes, the dancers are human. And when we stop singing, we will really be finished. And finally, I'm going to speak, Tony. Write it down. You don't remember anything. So those are <laughs> things that, that I basically turned into the book. I mean, that's what the book is really all about, is how it's, yeah. it's about you, we sing because it makes us happy. And when, we, mm -hmm. when we're happy, we like to sing. And also, um, a village that is, that is good when people sing a lot in it, partly because the time is redefined, um, mm -hmm. space is cleared, the village is cleared, everything is sort of put into its place. Uh, people are, have lots oh. of food to eat. Reset into so, right relation. So well, you also sort of reset bonding. the universe. Yeah. To reset the universe. There's this bonding though, you know, the euphoria increases, right? Through ceremony, through ritual, through rhythmic sound, through this duration. And also the crescendo of many voices at once. That's a bonding experience. Mm -hmm. I mean, we experience that when you're in a sports stadium and everybody's singing the same song, right? There's just sort of sense of bonding. These are bonding rituals. And I would also, is it is it rather like when we were in Australia talking to Aboriginal elders, it was about the song lines activating the ancestral beings. They needed to be renewed. They needed to be heard. They needed to be honored. And their blessings are for the land and for the people and bonding that. And so it seems to me that perhaps these rituals are also about reactivating the, the ancestors that gave those gifts that are important to them. Is that part of it, do you think? Uh, the ancestors really don't play much of a role. Um, oh. Australia is a very specific case. I mean, yeah. there are many places where ancestors do come, but in this case, spirits don't, ancestors don't usually participate at all. They are reestablishing things and, and sort of rebuilding okay, the world, the universe, but but without the the ancestral song lines part. Um, yeah. uh, Interesting, right? They the same kind the of function song, for music and and ritual. Well, let's yeah. take let's, let's take some questions. First of all, sure. Peggy was asking the extended lower lip, so we all understand the significance of that. Um, <clears throat> both men and women have their ears pierced and uh, in the sort of before contact with Brazilians, all men who lived long enough would, when they were adolescents would have their lip pierced and put a small plug in it like you can see today in many coffee shops and, um, and, but, and then they get it larger and larger and larger and, and uh, after, uh, con after they made peace with the Brazilians, most of the elders died. Um, and so they stopped the initiation ceremonies that would that would put lip discs in. So you would see in, in this particular in this videos, you see only very old men wearing lip discs. Now, I th thought of that, and I said, well, actually, the hearing is associated with morality. Um, when you if someone hears well, it means they behave well. And so that ear is more than just what we oh. think of as an ear. It's not just a receptor, but it's also a, it's an indicator of of hearing and understanding and doing. And so it seemed to be quite reasonable to, to pierce the ears of both men and women because both men and women ultimately have to behave morally. The men's lip disc is more like what I would call a PhD. You're licensed to, to sing and talk because once you, when you're young, you don't really engage in much oratory and, and formal speech. And, and um, after you've been through your full initiation, and have married and and uh, then you start then you have a different role in society and, and the role of is to speak and to be heard by the youth and and others and um so to a certain extent what they the, the lip disc is something they've been using for long for hundreds of years as far as i can tell and there are many there's some groups have lip discs some don't um uh and the, but I think the lip disc is, is, is kind of, an indi it was, it's part of the, the final initiation into adulthood. Oh, perfect. Did you notice the young men don't have that? It was just the elders. That's right. But also in enlarging the ear, is it a, a sense of I am hearing well, that these ears are important receptors of this? And so enlarging would make kind of a symbolic sense and same with well, the lip? 
I've, I've speculated that, yes, it's, it's actually an emphasis on hearing, a sort of a social creation of, of hearing and good behavior and a social creation of speech and oratory. Like, and like also, us, we wear things that are signifiers. Exactly. So. Now, but there are parts of, of, the, of the body they don't emphasize. One of them is the eye. Uh, they never wear eye makeup and they think it's very strange that we do. And, and they actually pluck their eyebrows. And um, oh. so and the, and the eye is associated with, with evil witches with, with people with people who kill people oh. and so, so, so oh. anybody who's an evil person with with that power has something living in their eye and so the eye is never is rarely separately ornamented very um, interesting and so oh. they they emphasize the mouth and the hearing and maybe the, but but not much the, the the eye isn't and so it seemed to me that they they're trying to socialize and emphasize the body itself and also the 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 moral and social attributes that go with that part of the body Oh, very interesting. Well, let me introduce yeah. Lawson. Has his Hi. question here. Yeah, and thank hey, you, Lawson. Lawson, for bringing Tony's <laughs> Tony and his book to us. Well, uh, thank you, Tony, for being awesome and all of this stuff that you that you showed us today and and everything that you talked about um, in the in the book and in some in uh, one of the articles about the Kinseji that was in uh, the, I think the SEM journal at some point. Uh, they, you kind of dived a little bit more into the different specific genres of, of singing and, and our kind of artistic expression. And the way that I read that and the way it was talked about by my professors was that you were kind of discussing uh, or demonstrating how there's not so much of a clear boundary between singing and, and talking and uh, or, or oratory and um, and just, you know, just casual conversation. And as a sort of as an extrapolation of that, there's not such a clear distinction between artistic expression and just normal daily life things. And one of the quotes that I, I always look back on from your book is actually, it's just on the second page of the preface, uh, but I promise I read further than that. But the quote is, um, it, I think you're talking about how you how you framed your research or your, or your method for uh, for discussing uh, everything that you learned and saw and you said rather than assuming that there is a pre-existing and logically prior social and cultural matrix within which music is performed you're examining the way music is part of the very construction and interpretation of social and conceptual relationships and processes. And for me, in my experience as uh, somebody who, who I studied music education for public schools for a couple of years, and then my actual work has been as an administrator at symphony orchestras, I've constantly uh, been up against the, uh, this idea in, in today's European and American society that the arts are auxiliary to, to other forms of knowledge and people are, are hyping up, you know, STEM education where it's all about the science and the technology and the mathematics and the stuff that helps the economy grow and, and gives us more technology and uh, better quality of life with stuff at least. But, uh, you know, whenever times have been tough, everybody's been right away, they're ready to cut funding for the arts and schools and they're uh, the granting foundation organizations that could give money to symphony orchestras for their performances or for their programs. They, they uh, move away from, from giving the money to them and instead give it directly to, to people that, to organizations that look like they have a clear social benefit that's easy to describe. Uh, and, and for the arts, it's, it's always difficult to put into words why the arts are so important. And I, I think it's just because it, it's there. Maybe it's that they're so important that you, they just can't put it into words. And I've always thought that um, that that quote about uh, that uh, music isn't something that came up from society, but music was necessary for the existence of society to begin with. Uh, I, I guess this is my chance to find out if I've just been reading that completely wrong. Um, and if not, do you have any thoughts on? how we can uh, try to try to encourage the society that we're in today to uh, to kind of change its perspective and and relearn how to how to value the arts and the importance of the arts in, in, a, in a fully functional and 
in society where where everybody can be well where everyone can have true well-being instead of just stuff and uh we're singing i guess like you said can make us happy <laughs> well you got you got it absolutely right um that's okay. exactly what i said that's exactly what i think and um how to change that into <clears throat> an understanding of our own society is hard pardon me <clears throat> partly because the market system we, 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 we the united states doesn't even have a ministry of culture um most countries do but one of mm -hmm. one of our exceptionalisms is we don't because i think people think that the market system takes care of culture and it doesn't of course it's it's only part of what music is there's many other kinds of performance and that, that is totally ignored by by markets and 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 is terribly meaningful to the people who do it and then there are parts that are part of the market like like classical music in the united states that that um doesn't really fit in, into the superstar system, though some some parts of it do, and and yet it's profoundly important to people. So it's it's a hard road to hoe in 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 the United States, particularly. Many other countries uh, pay much more attention to culture and fund it much better. Um, the uh, but but you got it absolutely right. You know when you when you take up a book like like this one, like like Why See Us Sing or 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 any other, I recommend that you, you should, you should always read the dedication of what do they dedicate this to? And my dedication is to my family and friends. Without one, there would be no life. Without the other, life is not worth living. And for Judy and the Suya, companions of many days and nights, in memory of the songs we sang, the stories we told, and the difficulties and pleasures we experienced. But then I think you should go and read the preface. In those five pages of my preface, I say everything that's important about the book. Absolutely everything that I say in the book is in those five pages. So you really uh, turn off my timer here somehow. There we go. Um, cancel. Um, so, so you're right to read the preface. And then I suggest that people usually jump to the end to see what the person is trying to prove and then read the rest of it to see if they actually get there, if they actually show you what, what they say they're going to show you. Yeah. So that, that goes for almost any ethnography in, in anthropology or ethnomusicology. That, that's a good way to approach a book. What's the, the other one? Yeah. yeah. Where's it going? And, and, and you're absolutely right. And you took it from exactly the right place. I think I state the ideas most clearly in those five pages about, about what the role of how, what, how, what music is and how it actually is not it's not a superstructure. It's not something that's created as an afterthought by society. It's an actually central part of society. And anthropologists over throughout the history of anthropology have pretty much ignored music. I've, always, I've wondered if they were tone deaf. Uh, they focus very much on language, but they don't, really, they don't really get music. And so I wrote this book partly to show anthropologists that you, know, there was, you could look at society as, as being a performance, and therefore you could actually look at at music as being the creator of an expression mm -hmm. of and the recreation of, of the, the ideas of, of society that are expressed. Well, and certainly a cultural container for yeah. transmission yeah, and preservation. Is it because it takes a different technology to record song and dance that, that only later came? The early um, anthropologists, they had pen and paper. They could write, but they weren't actually able to record everything like we can today. Well, but the, the pretty long ago now in 1891 i think was the first uh, ethnographic recording made by jesse fuchs of harvard among the passamaquoddy uh, mm -hmm. but but it was very restricted and our recordings have been very restricted but anthropologists did make recordings it's just then they transcribed the language and then they ignored the rest for the uh, most part yeah. uh, so so they weren't paying attention to the sounds and 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 i think um then recording improved after world war ii with the invention of the of the mm -hmm. or adoption of the german um, uh, a tape, real to real tape recorder was, was a profoundly, and that a portable tape recorder was a profoundly a transformative moment. And then the portable video camera was another. And I think with video, we finally overcame the separation of sound and movement that, that is so unjust when you're dealing with music. And um, if, if only, if only the inventor of the, the, the cylinder recorder who also invented video of sound, who also invented film, could have gotten those together, um, yeah. but they didn't until very recently. So that's why I'm using video. Uh, it, Was it, it also that anthropologists until recently were a little bit um, 
circumspect about diving in. You took part of the ceremony. You wore the masks. You were painted. You danced with them. But there's this idea that you shouldn't be, to be objective, you can't really dive in and be subjective. Where do you stand on that? Because there was that, oh. that idea. Oh, no, I'm just here to observe no, right. the passive right. observer. Well, I always turn nurse. Go ahead. Well, I think the, the the history of anthropology is a long and complicated one. But in the uh, but uh, Malinowski was really the one who said you should really get down in there and and join the people and and learn the the natives' point of view and not just apply your own point Indeed. of view to whatever it is they're doing. And that was way back in the nineteen twenties. So um, I think uh, there's some anthropologists who say you can't be objective. On the other hand, a, a long tradition in anthropology is what's called participant observation. You right. you participate, but you're observing. Um, mm -hmm. You're not you're not there just just to dance and sing. You're there actually to take those I to learn from dancing and singing and and learn to ask more informed questions and and also but to let the experience wash it's... over you gives you another body of um, perspective and experience with which to to understand right but yes. also the the suya the kijidi were so embracing of your music that you brought to them the parabolic antennas they're sitting in front of their computers how has you must have also been intrigued by observing how Western culture they adapted, they adopted it? How did it change them? What is that? What is that like today? So well, I, I, that's a work in progress. You know, uh, uh, there is no single answer to that. The um, they're very the elders are very concerned about about how to continue to do the things that they think are valuable. Yeah. And and then adapt as many good things as they can. And I've I've written an article showing that's a really ancient idea of theirs. Their idea is when you meet something and find something new, you take it. Yeah. And um, whether it's a song, or in the case of the German explorer who visited them in 1884, they stole his water thermometer. And then um, and then uh, now the you know the first thing they did was learn how to how to you know run motorboats and motors and and um, right. really really high tech audio and video equipment that I can't even afford that they have there so so they you know there's a constant adaptation of things that they think are important and they're trying to preserve the things that they also think are important which right. include performance of ceremonies yeah. and um, there was a culture war at one point in the in the community where the the, the elders were outlawing uh, musica sertanesia which is brazilian sort of country music oh i see and uh, they didn't think it was appropriate um, so they found that on, on sometimes like New Year's Eve when they used to they used to all sing their only their own music. Suddenly, all the young people would disappear and go to other places um, because they there was no you know, there was no Brazilian country music. So they began to incorporate country music into into their events as part of the things that makes everybody happy um, in in ceremonies. And so that wasn't that wasn't too hard. But there was a moment when which it was really you, you couldn't hear it and. Um, so I, you, you never know. Cult, you know. People are complicated and communities are, are diverse and complicated as well. But they, there is a, there's a real attempt to preserve things that they, they know are central to their being. And one of them is, is the mouse ceremony, which has been performed since this video was made, actually, in 2000. When was it made? I think the video was made in 2010 or something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank yeah. you, Lawson. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Perfect. I'm, I'm going to uh, also go over here to Rex Barker, because Rex shared a story with us in the chat room, but I thought he should speak himself here. Hi, Rex. Hi. Yeah, sorry. I, um, I spent uh, in the 60s, in the mid 60s, I spent time with the Kayan tribe in Sarawak. And um, I was with a commando, you know, as it happened out there. But one night, there was this incredible sound percolating through the jungle. It turned out the village had um, a, a gamelan orchestra. And the sound of this through the jungle was just absolutely stunning and it, how it changes you within. Because I was mesmerized by it and then invited down the next day. And it was part of um, a ceremony because they basically, it's when they gather the rice crops, because they have small little crop plants they gathered and put them in a barn and effectively it's like the harvest festival but they need to protect the barn from the evil spirits so it's three days of celebration which i was invited to participate in and i'll never forget that and this idea about having film and everything else there 
it touched me so deeply. I think if I'd have been trying to film it or record it, I would have not had the same experience. And I realized how much it touches you emotionally. And the last thing you do is you think about it because you're so engaged. Fast forward to 2010, and I was in a fortunate position by serendipity to media uh, moderate uh, a dialogue between the audience and the orchestra, the World Orchestra for Peace, in a concert. And yeah, everyone said, oh, it's just going to be a waste of time. But a uh, hundred people turned up after this. And the musicians were saying to me, it's going to be awful because Gurdjieff never talks about this stuff. And I just explained that the last thing we wanted to hear about is what people thought. But what we did, what I did want to hear about is how the music changed them and in what way. And, and I invited Gurdjieff to open it up. And an hour later, we stopped him from speaking because he really went into the fittings and everything else. And the, the orchestra members were stunned because they'd never heard him speak so passionately about something. He left and then it went on for three hours. And it was quite amazing how you could feel the energy in the room completely go through the roof. So for me, there's interesting parallels here. When people stop thinking about it, or more so when it's not some, I mean, I find classical music and particularly opera in the Western world, it's as if, you know, it's a certain privileged audience and only certain people can understand it, but it touches everyone. And, you know, somehow there's an inhibition there. So, it's very, it sort of goes hand in hand, I think, with the themes you've been talking about, Tony. Music does touch us. And why on earth do we focus on what we think instead of how it transforms us for a while? Thank you. Thank you, Rex. Yes, well said. I, I would just mention that I, I I never recorded the first time I saw something. Yeah, yeah. I, I would always watch it or experience it or participate in it first because it seemed to me, unless I had some idea of what was happening, um, I, I wouldn't make any sense to try to even turn on a tape. I wouldn't know where to put the camera or the tape recorder or, or position myself. And so, um, and besides, I wanted, I always wanted to hear it first. So I think you're right. Experience is part of what makes music, gives music its power. It is something you actually experience. It's not something you necessarily analyze. That's a secondary moment. And some people never have to analyze it at all. The experience is quite enough. I, I was amused that uh, during the, uh, during that period with the Cayennes, um, I played the guitar, but I also, uh, badly, I have to say, but I also, I, I enjoyed dancing and they were doing their dancing. And actually I taught them how to do the Charleston, which I thought was hilarious. Because <laughs> it was a wonderful music. That's but cultural also, exchange. Yeah. yeah, so it's sort of a fair exchange. And I think, you know, movement and everything else is much more fun when you just engage with it. Yeah. I have to say that the ethnologist, um, Tom Harrison, I spoke to him later. And I mean, he just, music just didn't touch him. So almost rather like, as you said before, anthropologists don't have that same sense. Well, Tony, if you, uh, if there was a minister Thanks, of culture for this country, I mean, think about how we export so much of our culture around the world and how it's embraced between film and music and uh, all of that. What would the minister of culture do? What would be his job? What would you recommend? What would you do if it was you? You know, we're the, lacking one. What if we had one? It here? would probably be dreadful. Um, <laughs> the, the, I, I worked uh, sort of as secretary general and president of an international organization that's affiliated with UNESCO. And, and one of the things that they were trying to do was to sort of create a declaration for the uh, uh, safeguarding of intangible cultural heritage around the world. And many countries that have ministries of culture have a all the all the ideas come from the top and they're applied down. The programs are started, but they're imposed on people from the bottom. And it's really hard to get people to open up enough to let it come up from the top. So imagine if American culture was subjected to political pressures. Hmm. Um, uh, there was a moment in which the Congress was considering uh, making square dance the national dance. And the folklorists especially came in and said, wait, why square dance? What is, what are you I saying? Give by prominence over everything else, yeah. Right, give that many times performed by Anglo people and, and, and a particular type of string band, a particular part of the country, 
Yeah. Why that? It, and and it really the dance is much more. There are many more kinds of dances, and so we're I think a melting part of, pot. Part of, part of the great advantage of not having a ministry of culture is we're spared um, centralized mm -hmm. polities. Uh, of the, mm -hmm. the disadvantages, of course, then that every NGO is struggling to find funding and and abilities and uh, to to do things. Um, in Brazil, I've done some really interesting things with the ministry. The ministry of culture has done some really interesting things, um, supporting uh, local. A local, all kinds of local performance spaces around the country. Uh, with, uh, Gilberto Gil, I think, had a points of light project that was really very exciting. Um, ministries of culture have also um, supported documentation of people's uh, mm -hmm. of, of people's performances so that, that they can have access to them later. Um, there are, ministries can do good things. It's not as though they can't, but you have to realize that once you have a ministry, then you're part of a governmental organization that that can be taken in all kinds of directions. Yeah. Some of them very positive, yeah. but some of them very scary indeed. I want to just give a shout out to, in Phoenix, there's the Museum of Musical Instruments. MIM. Okay, Musical Instrument Museum, MIM. Yeah. And it's fascinating. I mean, you, like we thought we were going to be there for a couple hours. No, we were there all day because they have these booths where they have the folklore, music playing, the World instrument, War, yeah. the costumes for each culture. I don't think there's not a culture that's not represented. Oh. And you go and stand in front, you hear the music play, you go to the next booth, you hear. And it's wonderful to hear the music, see the costumes, see the instruments, see some historic photographs. I mean, it's just beautiful. Mm -hmm. And everything, even for Hawaii, they had uh, indigenous women in the waves slapping the water in rhythm as the waves rolled in. Yeah. So um, it, it was just glorious. And of course, they have a huge wing for American music and all of its genre, which was also uh, beautiful. But if you're ever in Phoenix, spend many, many hours uh, going there. It's not too far um, from the airport, so it's a great place to yeah, go if you're I'd traveling back and forth. Acknowledge that. And then they'll have a display. I think we saw one on masks of the Congo so as what, well. Yeah. So it's cool. just wonderful to celebrate the rich heritage of music instruments and the costumes and the dance for all of the world. And I appreciate that we here today in this in this uh, time of day, we can in this era, we can we can really see it all. We can imbibe it all, at least briefly. So well, I, I think, think everyone should go see that museum. It's a great place. And, oh, yeah. And I've been there a number of times. Um, uh, and it's. it's when you start a brand new museum from scratch and send people all over the world looking for the best recordings, the best, best uh, instruments, it's really interesting. Um, yes. So go see it if you haven't. And then there are all kinds of other great music museums. You wouldn't think that music would do very well in a museum, but there's one in, in where is it? Berlin, I think that's really, or, or Berlin or Vienna that's quite spectacular on music. Um, all kinds of imaginative ways of, of bringing you in to, to experience what sound is all about. And uh, I yeah. recommend them. You've done, uh, you've had a, a really long and interesting and varied career. When now, when you ask that question, what is the power of music? What is its oh, magic? Yeah. How does it work yeah. its effect on us? What is your answer now that you've gained so much perspective and direct experience? And if I can well, add to that question just a bit, and that is, is that, you know, we, we in general in this program don't get into politics, but with what, your uncle and you know that what that represented the, that that time and period of, of life where folk music had to play a role of giving a voice to something music is a different quote unquote um political activation something's happening there which um hopefully can heal can can break down some of the boundaries that can bring us together that can be a yeah one, let's one have some of the healing force of music the yeah bonding exactly. force. we're in in need of that so that may be two separate questions but they kind of come together well, music can bring people together it can also divide them bitterly mm -hmm. and and people have sung uh, making peace but they've sung going to war yeah. and it's a it's a good part of create one of the things it does do well is create groups and 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 one of the things that the folk music group did was create a group that then could be in opposition to the military i think uh, sort of the military um, industrial complex and try to get out of vietnam but um the there are all kinds of ways music can be used. There's not just one. And I think my answer is how, you know, so my end answer is there are many ways that music is meaningful and it, different kinds of music are meaningful in different 
ways to different people. And that this, then that any of us can be deeply moved by music we've never heard before. I think mm-hmm. one of the nice things about music is that it doesn't take knowledge of language. It doesn't take knowledge of history and culture. You can be deeply moved by a music of the people you've never met uh, just by hearing them. And the, the internet today, provides a, a, a gateway to yes. a huge variety of experiences with music. Um, and the reason I d- decided to accept the offer to come to the Smithsonian and, and, and take over, uh, start up the new record company there that they just acquired from uh, its owner in New York City, uh, Smithsonian Folkways Recordings, was that I, I think music deeply affect, recorded music can deeply affect people. And, and I wasn't trying to sell recordings. I needed to sell recordings, of course. Nonprofits don't exist with no money. Um, so I had to sell them. But the selling of them, the purpose of the selling of them was to capture people's imaginations and to capture people's ears and to capture people's yeah. minds. And then to start them on journeys of, of learning how to play an instrument or going to live concerts. And, and so that to me, the recording itself was supposed to be, was more like a, I was fishing for people and I would try to catch them into the excitement about what they were hearing. And, and I think that's very much the possibilities we have with, with, all, with recorded sound. It's sometimes harder now to get out and find the performances and find out how to, how to start learning them, but there's a huge variety of, of resources. You can learn how to play an instrument on the internet about, uh, on certain types of software platforms. So it's really exciting. I got into, I was deeply moved by music as a child, by, produced by that record company, which produced over, oh, I don't know, almost a hundred recordings of my uncle Pete and a bunch by my aunts and uncles. Um, so so uh, it was a bit of a conflict of interest to take the job, but I, I thought it was so important that people be able to still hear those sounds that I wanted to be sure that the Smithsonian to, to, to make all of those sounds available, no matter what happened with formats and things. So you can now hear almost all of them on, on YouTube and you can also hear them on the, on the website or get a copy yourself. It's such an so, easy way to culturally exchange with one another is through the, the music, right? It's Yes, it used to be very... Just- it, it used to be hard. You couldn't get recordings across borders. They were they were they were quite difficult to ship. Um, but now you can cross borders everywhere, and and uh, and I hope people do. One of the good uses of our technology. I think Lawson wants to jump back on again. Okay, Lawson. Lawson, you're so muted. Hi. Hello. Uh, hey. You mentioned uh, you mentioned Abby Yo-Yo earlier mm-hmm. today, and. Um, and I, I've been thinking about that because uh, I guess jokes always have a little bit of truth behind them. And I think that uh, anthropologists and ethnomusicologists have very subtle ways of expressing humor in, in their research and their publications. And I felt like um, the inclusion of the, the Abby Yo-Yo recording with the, <laughs> with the Kinseje was kind of, kind of a, sort of a joke, like serious, but kind of just a humorous thing to do there. And I was wondering if there was if there was something uh, more more deeper and profound behind your inclusion of that um, than than just you know fun because it was fun. It, well, it, it it's it's a wonderful story. It's a wonderful song, and I included it because I wanted the book to show that particularly at that point in the book that this that there was a whole lot going on and that I was part of it. Uh, we, my wife and I were part of it. My, we, they were singing, but we were also singing. And I describe in the first chapter, I'm trying to put the whole thing in context. And I describe how they would ask us, how they asked us that night to come out and sing. And, um, and I thought, this is, you know, anthropologists shouldn't only objectify the other. They, sh- they should include themselves as part of, of what's Thank there. You. because And, yeah. and um, that's why it's there. And, and the most recent one has a, has a song that my wife wrote about an anthropologist. Goes, yeah. Oh, once there was an anthropologist, and for his PhD, this man had a dissertation to write. So he searched out a group of people to find out about. He wanted to know the truth. Well, so she sends up anthropology and a whole bunch of other things in the song. But um, but yes, and so we put that on the on the on the on the DVD. And actually on the CD, I maybe it is on the CD as well, the 2004. Yeah, that's actually. yeah, I have that recording. <laughs> yeah, so so um so, 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 so well, not only we part of it, but we can musically reflect on, on what we did by by writing songs. It takes a melody of the Kinseji. Uh and goes from there. Um so 
Yes, I, 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 this, what I really wanted to try to do is it's not just about them, it's about all of us working together. They taught me everything I know. Um, they learned a whole lot of things from, from asking us questions. And there, I learned how hard it was to answer questions. Um, and so it was, it was, it was, it's been a long, it's been a long and fun journey. Um, the exciting thing about doing research is you suddenly discover something that you'd never imagined before. Yeah. Uh, so it's sort of like falling through a floor. You suddenly, ah, the, the, the hole in the floor. You suddenly, ah, and, 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 and as long as you get one of those ah moments once in a while, you can put up with a lot of the frustration. <laughs> we go for the aha moment as well. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. You know, it's so that. incredible to have this ability to sing and dance. I mean, look at other species, birds sing, birds, some birds dance. Um, bees dance, whales sing, crickets sing. So, I mean, it's gifted to a few species to do this. So I, I just think it's one of the things that nature gifted us with, we must do. Well, rhythm. Yeah. yeah. As, as well. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Thank you, Lawson. Yeah. One last question I want to go to Farzad Mahudian, yeah, who's going to be one of our upcoming guests. Yeah. And he's asking also about uh, ancestors and other rituals, which is one of my questions. So okay. Farzad, also a professor of the humanities um, I can find uh, at NYU. So one of your colleagues there, Tony. Hi, nice to meet you. Thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. <laughs> nice um, to see you. Um, had a lot of laughs. Uh, <laughs> I was, just enjoyed the whole interaction as well as just all the different parts. Um, yeah, my question was, I thought uh, I'd always been under the impression that ancestor worship is kind of universal in some form. So I was wondering um, what other rituals uh, they have that do um, involve ancestors. And, and if so... Um, How's that related to the cosmology that they that they have, or at least honoring their ancestors, right? Whether they're right, well, human um, or other, yeah. The, this is one of the things that varies around the world, and hu humanities uh, has such a great variety of ideas that that it's, it's it's important to recognize that some people really do honor ancestors. Once when Akin said she dies, there's a great effort to get the. There is a spiritual part and a physical part, and the spirit goes off. But there's a great effort to get it to go away, uh, yes. as far as as soon as possible, because they're dangerous. They 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 wander around the village asking people to come with them and go yeah. and die and go with them. So so you, so for them, the effort is to actually get them to go away. You break everything that they were attached to, and and um, dig up off. their gardens and get them off. And and they go off and and they never really come back. Every once in a while a wind would come up suddenly and they would say, oh, that's the dead because they, they're having ceremonies all the time. So they're running to their next ceremony. And um, <laughs> so, so they're there, but the particular ancestors aren't, and they don't mention their names after they're, after they died for some time. So, yeah. so it, it is one of those things that they are very much in the present, in the present. And then the, the ideas of the cosmos are right there in the village structure and they're right there now. And, and, um, and the, they have moved and migrated, thousands of miles over over time as the, the sort of the great oh. big uh, movements of people in, in, in South America. So they they reestablish themselves repeatedly, but they don't actually think much about ancestors. Interesting. Oh, interesting. Well, it's almost as they would consider them ghosts and let's avoid that mm -hmm. uh, in a sense. Yeah. Interesting. Thank you for that understanding. Oh, exactly. It is so varied, oh, isn't it? It's it one is of the varied. fascinating yeah. things about your field is just the rich tapestry of of human culture and our response to our world and and our activities yeah so Thank we are positive. fascinating we humans aren't we <laughs> yeah. we love to think about ourselves We're i'm sure birds creatures. like to think about themselves too <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah well by well, way of conclusion uh this has been just a, such an enjoyable couple of hours with you tony thank you so much and thank you for all the the legacy that you are um, creating for culture and its preservation and understanding yeah. what do you want to say by way of conclusion Ah, by way of conclusion, I was trying to think, well, why do we sing? Then it's not for their ancestors, but it is for the pleasure of singing mm -hmm. and to recreate uh, the universe in, in it and sort of put it back into balance and to re mm -hmm. reinsert themselves in it because everybody, every time they learn a new song is in fact singing a different them. And, and so there's mm -hmm. a, it's a very complex and wonderful thing happening when they sing. And I hope you enjoyed the, the my, my sort of nervous attempts on a, on a, on a Sunday to, to bring that to you. But no. anyway, thanks Thank for you. your patience and I hope you uh, enjoyed it. Oh, I was fantastic. Well, 
Go ahead. I, I think that is such a sacred task, though, to renew the universe. That is like a, a task, a very big responsibility to keep renewing the universe and our place in it, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a beautiful sense. What if we had that sense as we went about our business? To reflect the universe, to look at it in its majesty, to renew it, to say, I have a hand in it. I'm a participant in it, not just of my own little sphere, but this grand sphere mm -hmm. in which we all exist. I mean, that's gorgeous, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Yes. So, well, as I say, we, we say? felt very privileged to be with them, to be able ah. to have the opportunity Fabulous. to be with them. We learned a lot. And I'm sure a loss of the education for your children as well to grow up with these multiple trips there. I mean, talk about expanding one's world mm -hmm. at a young age. And then so we really appreciate the, the scholarship, but also the heartfelt scholarship that you bring to the to the table. It's something it's something very mm -hmm. uh, powerful about that. And uh, so, mm -hmm. yeah, we, and we have your permission to post this on YouTube in terms of the do. excerpts yes. that we yes. that we yeah. that you graced us with Great. thank you i, thank you I so just much. prefer the people not record those sections and put them on on youtube oh, yeah, something no, else and we'll put that in and you won't that's that's connection. why i put yeah put that in um put that Lawson, in thanks thanks for bringing my book to everybody's attention and i'm glad you enjoyed it back there in the course that you have now that's now deep in your past and you're and now oh. that's sort of in a, in a new job then yeah that, i also uh, want to mention that right. lawson has an event coming up what is it lawson uh that uh, you have oh. with us so uh, earlier this summer, I got to visit Laura and Paul up in uh, up in Sedona, where they're I, they're at right now, and uh, I, we sat down for a short interview to talk about the history of the Kuyamunga Institute and the work and the future of the of the research and everything that they do there. And, and this isn't just a straight interview. He's dressed it up with all sorts of fun, creative things from Lawson yeah, Direct. So yeah, yeah, we're used to straight interviews, not not yeah. what you've done. So it's interesting. Good. It's a uh, film. Yeah. Yeah. I like to fancifully think of it as Anthony Bourdain, but with music. <laughs> oh, <very good. laughs> well, I thank appreciate you. Your, I don't your make career, it, I hope Tony, it well. and being an inspiration of what anthropologists can do and the impact that they can have, and even to help the Suya reclaim their ancestral land. You know, that's, I mean, you're really living the full impact of what anthropology can do for a culture. So I wanted to say, I yeah. wanted to acknowledge that as well about what you've Thanks. done and what you've accomplished. All right. I've Thank had a great time. Thanks. Blessings had a great and good time. health to everybody. And <laughs> yeah, join us next week. Bye. Bye-bye. Blessings. Thank you.